Hello, Mr. Parker. Good to see you. How can I help you? Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you for this offering of this telemedic uh, hour from you in your practice. My heart, uh, my my throat is aching for a few days now, and I just ask you for. I have to ask you for help because I'm not sure if I should come to you and take the way uh, all the way from my rural area into your uh, practice or into your hospital. Can you may help me? Oh yeah, sure. That's no problem. I've seen that you already sent, on, uh, sent me all your data, this is perfect. Um, I have access to your uh, diabetes, uh, sugar values, you also sent me your hemoglobin parameter and your current ECG via your watch, and you also sent me your uh, vital parameters, measured fever and so on. I can access everything, that's fine. Um, I just uh, need one more info, uh, maybe could you just put your camera into your throat and open it up? <laughs> is that fine? Oh yeah, this looked fine. Okay, very good. So yeah, um, I would conclude that it is very, it is uh, yeah probably a common cold, and you should be fine with it. Um, just for a little pain medication and take some tablets for the next few days. In case it gets it gets worse, you can always contact the nurse, which is um, in your region, and also you can go to the medibox at the bus station. So in case it gets worse, just contact them. They will come back to me as well. And in case it gets even worse and yeah, you feel really bad, you can always call the emergency. Could I help you with this, or you have any more questions? Oh, thanks, that's really cool, thank you so much. I've got only one question, since the pharmacy has closed, um, how do I get the pain medication? Because, yeah, it's very hard now for access. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no problem, I uh, already have an, um, have an agreement with a drone company, so the medication will be delivered to you by drone, and the recipe for it is delivered to you by WhatsApp in like a few minutes. So you just scan it at the drone and then it all works fine and it gets paid by your health insurance. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much. This is so cool. Uh, thank you for your help and yeah, see you next time. Bye. <laughs> this might seem futuristic, but it's definitely not. It's something which could happen in lots of countries right today if some actors would be a little more innovative and if some people would just know what potential there is. I want to look at the Kanmit role model, which is the most common role model for doctors and used for yeah, um, structuring education in medicine for lots of years and also for the next um, step we um, have in German medical education. And there is a 30-page outline of this Kanmit roles last updated in 2015. The amount of times the word digital appears in there is one in 30 pages and I thought to myself are these roles as good as they might be really for the future doctor the ones that are necessary to perform best for the patients we have a medical expert in the center knowing everything and we have competencies surrounding him communication with the patient collaboration with other health professions leading a team advocating health learning for life and being professional in your decisions. But is that everything, or are there adaptions needed? I just want to focus um, on the main areas of digital healthcare I believe uh, we are talking about. On the one hand, it is artificial intelligence and big data. It is more data, which we can access and interpret in a ve very much quicker way. It is telemedicine, where we can talk with patients over kilometers, over hours, over nations and where we can also talk with doctors um, out over those borders. It is about e-health, where we have electronic documentation, all our records, all our information available online. Everyone knows this. Where do I search for my vaccination record? You won't find it. The doctor needs 15 minutes to analyze it. You put it in, in, in the electronic patient record, and the AI analyzes up, uh, after one second you have the results which, which vaccinations are needed in the next year. And you have mHealth, mobile health, which are all the applications you may have on your smartphones right now and you don't even know of them, or they are available in the App Store and you don't know they exist and may improve yours or maybe your grandparents' health very much right now. Going from a patient who arrives with a symptom, with a concern like Mr. Parker, enemies, the talk between doctor and patient, it will change drastically during, uh, because of an information overload for both. The doctor has more information available from the patient. He gets everything transmitted, maybe even before, uh, as we just saw in the example. 
And also he gets it pre-analyzed by AI maybe, and he just has to find his structure, find his way of all those information, but at least he's got them. And he, does not, he doesn't need a fax gerät, where I don't even know if there's an English word available anymore because we only use it in German hospitals. Um, <laughs> and and uh, yeah, he doesn't need to call for two hours to get some data. But also the patient, he has unlimited access to medical knowledge. He can go in the internet, search up for everything, and now, and this is, a, this is starting and yeah, also um, is quite far, he's got apps and applications to help him um, structure these data onto his needs and make suggestions. And then he goes with these suggestions to the doctor and asks him about it. So currently we approach a doctor and it's like, I, I've got no clue about myself, but I've got a problem. Give me an answer. And the doctor will answer it with his best knowledge. And now the patient comes and says, my app has told me I could have this and this and this. And when the doctor says no, then he has to explain and he has to be a really a much better communicator in that because he has to convince the patient and he gets challenged by other AI technologies or maybe other doctors the patient just called in Australia um, which told him something else. So learning for life, learning the new technologies, learning new um, studies is uh, way more important and communicating in a totally different way with a patient. Coming to diagnosis, we have autonomous diagnostic devices in Sweden, grandmas at home have a robot, and the robot takes blood by himself. He has like a, um, um, a so sonographic assistant, or uh, he has a sonographic uh, medium, scans the blood veins and goes in there and takes blood and then sends the results back. Um, we have radiologists um, who have to think about, yeah, AI-powered uh, imaging assistants. Studies have proven that in early cancer detection they are already matching and they will get better and better as a radiologist can only see, I don't know, 10,000 pictures in his 40 years life, or maybe a little bit more. But an AI, which is filled in by all data available from the whole world, yeah, you may get the sense of it, what it means. But could this lead to, an, and I already mentioned it, information overload? What is really clinical relevant for the patient? Are all the informations available really needed for this one simple answer? The doctor has to, uh, has to ask him, him itself, is he always taking a professional decision? Is he managing the data correctly and taking the right conclusions? Artificial intelligence will definitely not replace doctors. It will not replace radiologists. But those radiologists who use AI will probably replace the ones who don't. It is about symbiosis, not about a parallel world where one is better than another, but about taking the benefits of both and combining them. Going on to therapy, we, the, the, the plan is that every person who's coming with a cancer gets an individual treatment, an individual antibody who matches with his genetic parameters. It is not like, oh, my, my grandma has colon cancer, then she will get the same as everyone else. No, she will be analyzed and all the data available will transform into a specific therapy regime. And this even applies to every diabetes where we say now, okay, we have got a range of two to three where you should be in. No, for you, with your concerns, with your differential diagnosis, with your other medications, 2.4 was the medium best a big database suggested us. We can use those apps for chronic diseases. Every patient can treat himself and can um, monitor himself and does not need to go to a control appointment every three months, although everything is fine. Um, and we can improve the medication framework and also compliance by, yeah, I, I mean, lots of, of the girls out of you would, will probably know an app which they use and every day at a certain time they put, okay, I took this pill. Um, <laughs> this goes on and on and when, when your grandmas would do it, they will be much more compliant with their medication. <laughs> but there's one constraint and this is very important. More data quantity does not mean more data quality. In research, we put in the data, and with this data we conclude, and we uh, have evidence uh, conducted out of that data, and then we translate it to the patient. And when the data input is bad, and this is the same data we use, it is still the same data, it is the blood uh, sugar level we, we take. We put it in there, and we have a question answered. So we should look at studies the way we look at them now, and not see, oh, AI conducted study, oh perfect, that's fine, they are so intelligent, I don't know what it is. We should understand what artificial intelligence is, how it works, and what are the barriers where even artificial intelligence is not more intelligent than our minds who can translate data onto patient needs.
patient saved. We have anamnesis, diagnosis, therapy. No, we've got, we have forgotten the main aspect and probably also the main aspect where um, yeah, di digital healthcare can assist us. And this is prevention. The best patient is the patient who never becomes one. It is the one who's always healthy. And our system, and especially also our, the economics of healthcare, they benefit the ones who treat and do not benefit the ones who prevent. And with the self-controlling, the self-managing, the people who act or, and, and are a lot more educated about their own health, there's the possibility that doctors also concentrate on prevention a lot more and help the people and assist the, the people to prevent diseases to come because we can detect way, uh, um, risk factors a lot, more early, a lot earlier and also we can help a lot earlier. So we go into a new era, era of prevention. We want to collaborate with other interprofessional uh, actors in healthcare, like tackling obesity. We tackle obesity, the patient comes and he has already got diabetes, high uh, uh, blood, level, um, blood um, uh, pressure, and um, all the things which doing, um, are in common with it. But we want to start at school, we want to educate people about their health, what ob obesity means. We want to have um, maybe a health, more healthy meals. We want sports clubs who uh, um, work together with us. We want other healthcare professions who work together with us. So it, it should be a network of healthcare professionals and also other parts. Also every um, policy making institute has to um, watch at what health prevention can mean for every single one who doesn't get ill and also for the whole society. Um, we have to enable the patients. We have to start, start uh, teaching health in school and how to, uh, yeah, how to prevent diseases, how to act healthy. Um, we have to improve the self-monitoring, give the patient the chance and give the patient the right to look after his own health and do not think I'm the God, he has to come to me and then I only take the benefit out of my confidence that I gave him the best advice. Maybe the patient has got even better advice for himself and the patients will definitely still come because they want, to uh, want somebody that they can trust in and that is a communication issue again and a health advocacy issue. We have, though, uh, also one, uh, have to look on the other side as well. Going, uh, getting up at, in the morning, looking into the mirror, and the mirror tells you, oh, your blood pressure is too high, oh, this is too high, you should eat this today, you should eat five calories, uh, five grams of banana and two grams of this. We can also, this spiral can go too far, and we over-monitor and are our own big brother. So we have to look where are the borders, and these borders are probably individual, and should also be defined by the doctor-patient relationship. Going to the system, we have a worldwide revolution through digital healthcare. We have universal access to knowledge and medical assistance, independent of three variables. Time, at night I wake up, I have no doctor available because they all sleep, but they only sleep in Germany. They are awake in Australia, so I may call an Australian doctor. The radiologists may call an Australian radiologist which is awake and can answer questions better. We have independent of location, and I want to insist on this point because I think it's the most um, important one. Currently, we think about all, the, all those big tech companies with all those innovations, and we go from, from top to top, 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 and we forget about people living in rural areas and about people living in third world countries, what digital health can mean for them. One of the um, best available anamnesis apps was just translated in Swahili. And there's a very, very big chance of people who have no access at all to healthcare, which is not, we moan about that 30 minutes from us, there's no doctor, but they have no doctor at all. And they now have access to the same information, the same artificial intelligence, the same technology um, benefits as we have. This, um, this can very much equal um, a lot and benefit those patients as well in rural areas. Yeah, it, it can be Sachsen-Anhalt, but it can also mean Canada or Australia, and you see the vast differences even in that. And of course, the medium. I just talked about that on a, yeah, um, not face-to-face, -face, which is definitely the best, but it's just not available, and it will not be available for everyone in the future. So it should maybe be face over, um, yeah, computer. It maybe is face to a robot. It, it depends. And it depends when, you, when do you need the doctor, when is the doctor still needed. And of course it, it is still, the doctors are still needed, but in a different way and on a, in a different um, point. So health systems need education, 
they need education for everyone, starting in school, and they need to change medical education drastically. In my six years of studies, the word digital probably appeared in zero lectures, I would say. Um, it is just nothing about it, nothing about the future. It is just from the past 10 years or the past 20 years, what the professors have learned, we get taught, we don't look into the future. We need evidence, and this is very important because AI, big data, does really not mean that we have better studies overall. We can have better studies because we have more data, which is translated quicker, but we need to control the quality of data. We need people who really can look into studies and see if the endpoints are correct and if they are chosen for the patients. And when big tech companies do, do big studies, we should check if this is not for their maximum profit, but for the maximum profit of health. We have to look on data security. This is crucial for trust of all people in this system. And we have to look on policy making and what regulations governments can choose. And our German government has chose quite good regulations currently. So future doctors, they shift from a medical expert who knows everything to one who, who knows where to find everything, how to analyze and how to interpret these informations. So being a data manager instead of an expert right from the beginning. And they have to proactively and visionary co-shape this future for the best possible symbiosis with technical developments. When we don't act as doctors in our care for the patients and shape this future with us, then other countries will do it with other purposes in mind, other companies will do it with other purposes in mind. We have to be the ones who go ahead and tackle these challenges with us and go for the benefits. Not future doctors, current doctors. And we have to start now and everyone has to start. Also the 55 year old doctor. So Canvas is not ready for digital healthcare. It's a really good model because it includes lots of highly needed competencies. And we saw how competencies will be strengthened and will be widened. But we need a visionary. We need a third, even a third X, like a trans-dimensional X. And this visionary will, and we are very happy about it, be included in the new learning goals for German medical students due to our engagement. But the very important role is the role of the data manager. And this will even be in the center probably in a few um, years. And the question is, is it in the center of medical studies, in the center of heads of clinics, heads of um, yeah, the different sectors? I don't know. Um, but it should be, and this is very crucial, because then we really can improve healthcare for all of the patients on the globe. Thank you very much.